Hello and welcome for the first time or welcome back to Tala Talks NICU where we break down medical concepts and make them really easy for you to understand. Today, as many of you have already requested, we are going to go over BPD or bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And because we're trying not to make these videos too long, again, we've decided to divide this video into two different parts. So today we're going to go over one, what is BPD? Two, how do you diagnose BPD? And three, what causes BPD? In the next video, we'll go over four, how do we prevent BPD? Five, how do we treat BPD? And six, the outcomes after BPD. So as per usual, just before I start, remember to like this video if you want to and to subscribe to this channel if you're interested in just getting overall NICU content. One, what is BPD? BPD is another three letter acronym that stands for bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which describes a chronic lung disease or a lung disease that babies have for a long period of time that started when they were premature. BPD was first described by Northway in 1967. At that time, a lot of babies had really bad RDS and a lot of them died from RDS. If they did survive RDS, then they continued to have respiratory symptoms for a long time. Eventually, that prolonged respiratory course after that initial RDS was labeled BPD. So it's that stage when the infant is over the initial RDS and the initial surfactant deficiency, but they're still needing oxygen. They still have respiratory symptoms. They still may need, may need pressure support and their x-rays don't look normal. That really is BPD. BPD affects about 10 to 15,000 infants a year in the United States, and obviously a lot more than that internationally. About 40% of extremely low birth weight babies, that's babies that are born less than 1,000 grams, will end up developing BPD. Now, because more and more of these extremely low birth weight babies are actually surviving, we're all doing a much better job with keeping micropremies alive, then obviously we would expect that there's going to be a higher population that's susceptible to getting BPD. So BPD is actually one of the few three letter acronyms in the NICU that we really haven't been very good at decreasing the rate of. So why do we care so much about BPD? So what if a baby goes home on a little bit of oxygen or um, just has respiratory symptoms? The reason why we care about BPD is that we know that infants with that diagnosis, especially obviously with a severe BPD, have a much higher chance of having issues later in life. So have higher issues of having developmental problems, cerebral palsy, even decrease in academic performance, decrease growth, as well as a whole host of pulmonary um, um, problems as well as readmissions to hospitals. Number two, how do we diagnose BPD? So the interesting thing about BPD is that it really is a clinical diagnosis. It isn't a lab test or necessarily a chest x-ray that you can look at and say this baby definitely has BPD. Although there are some kind of pretty typical x-ray findings in infants with BPD and I'll get to that later. Really how we diagnose BPD is how much support the infant needs, how much oxygen as well as how much positive pressure support. Obviously, this is a pretty subjective diagnosis, but I'll get to that in a second. Historically, loads of different definitions have been used to diagnose a baby with BPD. Initially, the diagnosis was based on the fact that if you needed oxygen for 28 days, then you had BPD. But then as more and more babies were surviving, that seemed pretty unfair. So for example, if you're a 22 weeker, at 28 days of life, you're still 26 weeks. So it's a bit harsh still calling that BPD. In 1988, the clinical definition of BPD became, do you still need oxygen at 36 weeks correct to gestational age? And I'm gonna talk about other different issues with that, but basically that is the definition that stands most commonly now and that is used most frequently in literature. Is a baby still on oxygen at 36 weeks correct to gestational age? The Canadian Neonatal Network published a study that showed that developmental outcomes at 18 to 24 months were best predicted by whether a baby needed oxygen at 40 weeks, not at 36 weeks. 
However, the problem with that definition, as I'm sure you're all realizing, is that there are a lot of babies that are discharged home before 40 weeks. So they're discharged home at 38 weeks or even 37 weeks or whatever. So you're not necessarily picking up all the infants. And there have been a lot of other refinements since then. As you can imagine, a lot of researchers argued that there is going to be a huge difference in outcomes between a baby that is on a tiny bit of oxygen at 36 weeks versus a baby that's literally needing a conventional ventilator at 36 weeks. Because of this, the BPD has been classified further into mild, moderate and severe BPD. Remember, just as an aside, that in medicine, when you're making a classification between different stages, they all actually have to mean something. So, for example, in cancer, you're not just arbitrarily saying stage one, two, three, four, or whatever. If a patient has a stage one diagnosis, then their prognosis should be much better than a patient with stage two. That's where the cutoffs are made. So, obviously, depending on the amount of oxygen or support that you need, you should expect a worse outcome if you're making the differentiation between mild, moderate, and severe. Even that definition has had its issues, and anybody that's worked at the bedside will realize this. So what do you do about the baby who's on one liter, 21% at 36 weeks, but for whatever reason, you take that one liter off and the baby starts desatting? or the baby is on 0.02 liters of 100%, which is basically kind of 22%. How do we classify that? The most recent attempt at classification of BPD was made by an NICHD workshop where they put BPD into three different grades. Basically, the difference between grade one and grade two was whether you were on more or less than three liters of oxygen flow at 36 weeks. And grade three was when you needed any amount of positive pressure, so CPAP or you were actually even intubated. Obviously, like I said already, the issue is, is that we can't just say it's grade two. That also has to be associated with a worse prognosis than a grade one BPD. But as you all know, and we've talked about many times, following up NICU patients is really hard. They move around, they get lost to follow up. The other super complicating thing about BPD is that there's still a lot of lung growth to be done after the baby leaves the NICU. So it's possible that a baby leaves, has absolutely perfect nutrition and doesn't get readmitted into the hospital, doesn't get any reinfections. That infant is probably going to have a slightly better outcome lung-wise than a kid that had the same course but isn't getting ideal nutrition and gets readmitted with RSV a couple of times in the first year of his life. Another complicating thing with the diagnosis of BPD is just how how subjective the need for oxygen is. So say you're 36 weeks and a baby is kind of occasionally desatting, then you decide one day that you're going to try to take the baby off the one liter 21% that they're on. Maybe somebody that night sees that the baby has a quick desat and just puts the baby back on again. Or maybe the baby is breathing a little bit fast. So for that reason, the baby is on a nasal cannula. Maybe they'd still be breathing at exactly the same speed if they were off the nasal cannula. So there's a lot of subjectivity in that, just in the same NICU between the different providers. In 2003, a paper was published by Walsh et al. that basically tried to decrease this subjectivity. And they recommended that we should get a physiological definition of BPD. Basically, what they said was that if at 36 weeks or close to 36 weeks, a baby was on above 30% oxygen, then that was it, or on any positive pressure support, then that baby was diagnosed as having BPD. But if infants were on less than 30%, then all infants were given a room air challenge. Basically, these kids were slowly weaned off oxygen. And then once they were on room air, if their SAT stayed above 88%, and this was later changed to above 90% for an hour, then they were considered to be stable on room air and to not have BPD they found that this decreased the rate of BPD by about 10% because effectively what you're doing is just removing the subjectivity. The room air challenge is probably something you should all be doing in your units right before 36 weeks, kind of 35 to 36 weeks to prove whether baby really does need oxygen or not. So in summary, 
the clinical definition of BPD is having an oxygen requirement at 36 weeks. Obviously, there's loads more classifications, but for the purposes of this discussion, just remember that. Three, what causes BPD? Well, like all of you, I'm sure have used a million times in your training, we all learn different mnemonics. And I agree, a lot of these mnemonics kind of almost make it harder because you're trying to remember what each letter stands for. But the classical one for BPD is that it is caused by the seven Ps. So the seven Ps are one, prematurity, two, positive pressure ventilation, three, prolonged oxygen exposure or just having a lot of free oxygen radicals, four, protracted use of ET tubes, this one's weak, basically it means that the baby's intubated for a long period of time, five, pulmonary edema, so the baby could have that from PDA or overhydration or just um, has delayed diuresis, six, pulmonary air leaks, so for example you have a pneumothorax or you have really bad PIE, and seven, really bad pro-inflammatory cascades. So if a baby has many episodes of sepsis or has many surgeries, then they're more likely to have worse BPD. Really though, you can break all of these down into three main subgroups. The first one is prematurity or just having really immature lungs. Number two is just injury to the lungs, whether it's from being intubated, whether it's having a pneumothorax, whatever it is. And number three is just inflammation. So for example, like we were saying, a pneumonia or a sepsis or whatever. The two strongest risk factors for BPD are prematurity and low birth weight. As you know, if a baby is born very prematurely, then by definition, they're going to need some form of respiratory support, even if it is just CPAP. Being on any ventilator causes injury to the lungs. And our body's response to any injury is to get some sort of inflammation, which in itself can be even more damaging to the lungs. Critical development of the lungs is happening throughout pregnancy, obviously. And really the last trimester, the third trimester, is when a lot of the alveoli are actually forming. So you can imagine that if these babies are constantly getting injury to their lungs, whether it's CPAP or, or the uh, ventilator, or whether it's just still needing a high oxygen, and they've got the inflammatory response, then just the combination of those two may affect the actual development of the lungs. So those alveoli may not develop as well just because of what they are being exposed to. This is an important point because it's really very different from an adult who is on the ventilator for a long period of time. Yes, the ventilator will injure the lungs and they'll still get the swelling and everything, but it won't affect the growth and development of the lungs themselves. When it was first described in 1967, the focus of BPD was really on the injury that happens in the lungs and kind of the scarring from the non-compliant lungs and the oxygen that the lungs are being exposed to. And Northway described the progression of BPD by using pathological slides, so babies who had passed away, as well as x-rays that showed all the scarring and the fibrosis in the lungs because of the injury that the lungs were exposed to. Obviously, the younger and the smaller the baby, the higher the chance of developing BPD and, and severe BPD. But now it's thought that it's not really just because of the injury and the inflammation and the oxygen that the baby's being exposed to, but by definition, the younger that the baby is, then the more that the lungs have to grow and develop outside the mother. So the higher the chance that just the development of the lungs is going to be abnormal. And this has been shown in specimens that infants with BPD have decreased number of alveoli and those alveoli themselves are made abnormally as compared to infants without BPD. And then just generally, the more injury that the lungs suffered, then the worse their BPD is going to be. So the longer that they need to be on the ventilator, the more oxygen, the higher the concentrations of oxygen they're exposed to, whether they had a chest tube, if that infant had several bouts of pneumonia, obviously that's really going to increase the inflammation in the lungs. All of those will contribute to a worsening BPD. Remember, by the way, in utero, the infants are getting their oxygen from the mother's venous blood. So basically they're exposed to saturations of kind of 50, 
So after an infant is born, we now want the baby to have SATs in the 80s and 90s. So you can imagine that for a baby that's technically still supposed to be in utero, that really could provide a lot of free radicals and could be very damaging for the lungs and the rest of the body. And that's the end of the first part of BPD. Please look out for the next part where we'll kind of go into a little bit more detail. In the meantime, please remember to like and to subscribe this video and let us know what you'd like us to talk about next. Thank you so much for being here.